you uh, have taken some time to come down and be part of this, um, we thought it might be helpful for some who were not able to attend the annual meeting to hear um, a little bit of, of an update about um, about where things stand with our um, uh, our budget and the work that the best finance and inventory have done on that. So um, I want to um, introduce to those of you who may not know Peter, uh, Peter Baumgarten, who is our new treasurer. Um, and right after, he, not long after he became treasurer, he was just um, uh, recently nominated and then uh, uh, approved this morning again. You need to become a member of the vestry. So I'm um, very grateful for Peter and the work that he's done. Also want to thank Drew Uly, who's been a treasurer for the last three years and has continued to serve in the, as an assistant treasurer. Uh, they've done really, really fine work working with our finance committee and with the vestry to approve the budget. Peter. Wonderful. Um, some of you were here earlier on to the, today for the annual meeting, so you get to see whether or not I've improved my content from, from time one to time two. Um, but what I'm going to do, um, other than make sure I'm quick enough so that my little one fits in the background, hey, Fitz is not melting down in a short bit, is to walk you through a couple things on how to think about the structure of the finances of the church. First, kind of high level, how does it all fit together? And then uh, second, the implications for the budget downstream. And perhaps some things for the vestry and church leadership to pay attention to uh, over time. So um, first thing to think about is there's a couple different categories whereby we can think of the structure of the financial um, resources coming from when it comes to our operating fund over a given year. The first one, which is the one that most people are familiar with, um, is that uh, one that most churches are made up of, is the mix of annual pledges as well as plate giving or other category. Um, so when you think of that structure, most churches that don't have endowments are set up and essentially run in this particular category. Now, St. Peter's has the benefit of having a couple different endowments to draw from as well, um, but a good portion of the funding that goes into the church comes from this bucket and ends up being, at least in this year's budget, about 80% of our spend is covered by annual pledges um, and then also plate and other giving. Um, and so the big thing to think about here is that this is kind of the call to action for the, those of us that um, are invested in uh, with our time and resources and energy in this church is to also be invested financially because this really does allow us to do all the stuff that happens, whether it's the lunches, whether it's our staff. Um, these things are driven by, by annual pledge giving. Um, the other piece of the story, which is somewhat unique to St. Peter's, not the only church that is has an endowment to draw from, um, but nonetheless, not every church has this, is that we have a set of endowments, the largest of which is this general fund. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few of the other ones too as well, but you have some that are specifically tied towards uh, parts of the church, like the Columbarium or the Wurzel Fund for general operations, the music and ministries tie, the part tied towards the lecture series, capital improvement, music, so on and so forth. These were gifts given um, at a given time that move into the endowment. Uh, my day job is I, I work at Washington University in St. Louis, so I think about endowments a lot. My professorship is an endowed professor. My center is an endowed center. Uh, and then typically what you see there is that uh, the endowment pull, like it is here, is oftentimes a 3 to 5% pull of a, uh, a rolling average, a three-year average of that, of that amount. Um, and the idea there is if you pull at 5% and you allocate in a certain way, we wouldn't draw down on the endowment in ways that would be problematic. The hope is that this does continue to um, fuel St. Peter's for the next 150 years in addition to um, the last bit. So there's a few differences there. General fund, 3 to 5% pull, same with columbarium, as well as the Aiken fund. A few of the others are tied towards just pulling interest and dividends. And then uh, two of the funds in particular are less linked towards particular contribution limits that fund things like lecture series and the like. Now, in a given year, this year in particular, 15% of our costs are covered by that. Uh, I'll show you a few of the details there in a second to show you how that all factors together. But for those of you doing the math at home, you'll notice that 15% and 78% don't uh, add up to 100%, uh, which means that in this year, as you'll see here, uh, we're proposing an unbalanced budget or a budget with a deficit. Now, I, I want to highlight that because in certain years, in fact, last year, as you'll notice, was one of those years when the revenue comes in ahead of the expenses. The good news on that is that we have an ability to add to our cash reserve, roll that over into the cash excess to use in years that are leaner. And then in other years, 
when all of a sudden our expenses are over and above that of our fund for that year, to the extent that we have flexibility from past years, we can draw down upon that amount. Now, we don't want to, as I'll talk about in a second, get into the pattern of just relying on an ability to draw down because we don't think that's fiscally responsible as a way to run the church long term. Now, with this all said, uh, with this kind of layout here, with a mix of annual contributions, endowment draws, as well as the way that you fund that operating expense fits, getting another sandwich. Um, I want to then take you into a bit of what we did over the last little bit. Hey, buddy. A bit of what we did over the last little bit from a budgeting standpoint. So I stepped into this role in about early November. Um, Drew was gracious to step into an assistant, and I really do frame assistant in a way that doesn't at all reflect his contribution to this. Um, I learned a lot from working with Drew in this role. Uh, but the two of us worked with a committee of folks that was um, advising us on how to think about the budget. We worked with church staff and then had a series of meetings as well with Vestry, where eventually the Vestry approves the budget for the next year, which happened last week. And so I want to go through how we thought about those pieces here. So um, I'll break it into three categories. One, looking at all the revenue together and just flag a few points that are maybe different from previous years so you can kind of see where we landed and then a few things on the cost side as well. Um, just so you're kind of aware of what we had to deal with, when we looked at the first estimate for revenue and costs, there was about a $275,000 to $300,000 gap between those numbers, um, which wouldn't be fiscally responsible to say, let's propose $300,000 of gap. Um, and so we had to think about what was a reasonable estimate on the revenue end, um, where there could be areas of cost savings, and then can we invest in the strategy, changing strategy of the church, so that in future years, uh, this is less of an issue when it comes to the budgetary gap. So I'll flag a few points there and then obviously open up to questions at the very tail end. Um, so the first point that I want to note is on the, um, on the revenue side from uh, our expectations for annual pledge. You'll notice that that number is down. A big part of the reason why it's down is we have to reflect when people move or if people pass away. So we basically look at past year's contributions and then assume that it's going to be the same for the next year if they're still here. Now, if the church grows, that could grow. If individuals contribute more, it could grow. If someone who's been contributing by plate says, you know what, I want to pledge this year and, and be a little bit more explicit about that, all of those things could grow. Uh, but we started first by saying, let's look at about a million dollars, um, which was our estimate from the team here on this side. And then we try to be somewhat aspirational, which is saying if we are transparent about this, is it possible to think about a 5% increase of that number? Perhaps tied towards the fact that people are now back more in church, higher engagement. There's more points to engage with the congregation from youth ministries to adult ministries. Our hope is that those are things that reflect uh, more of a value to our community, and people are willing to support that value with contributions. Now, I'm talking to the you all that would be a part of that, right? So I'm not talking about an abstract other person that's talking to myself. How can I think about giving 5% more this year than I pledged last year, for example? So that, that number is how we landed on this piece. So pretty similar to what we saw in 2020 as actuals. This projected number you can think of as being actuals. A um, few other things that are worth noting. Um, we have a couple things kind of like this that involve uh, engaging the congregation together. So the food truck event, for example. And one thing that we started to consider is whether or not there might be opportunities to have sponsors, individual sponsors for those events. Um, so there's a very small line item there that allows us to think a little bit more creatively about sponsoring particular types of events. And then the other thing that's different there, you'll notice the endowment draw goes from 191 to 131. Now, there's a couple reasons behind that. One is that the market right now is down. So if you're looking at a three-year rolling average, even if you were pulling the same percentage, the total amount drawn would be lower. But the bigger story there is um, we have a relationship with a separate committee, the endowment committee, where they are holding... Uh, the endowment draw to between 3 and 5%. And so if every year we're ending up in 5% or let's do 6% this year, what about 7%? Mm -hmm. 
that would be a situation that wouldn't be responsible from the endowment perspective. So uh, we agreed last year to go back to a more traditional draw of 3% um, after having a couple years in a row at the high end of that, hence why this number is lower. Now, on the revenue end, these are things that can and should move, hopefully, in a positive direction. So I hope that at the annual meeting, as well as today, people say, hmm, like maybe we should consider giving in a slightly different way this year. But it is our responsibility to be conservative on this end, um, rather than, for example, just make the revenue line and the cost line match up uh, by virtue of waving a certain kind of magic wand. So really trying to be conservative on that front. On the cost side, um, a big thing to note here, um, you all are aware of this, but when you look at the total cost, a big percentage of it on the pie chart is tied towards people, right? It's the people that make this church move from the rector to the staff to the entire team involved in this work. Um, and as a result, those are things that are harder to uh, adjust from a budgeting standpoint. Now, there are times where you'll see this when people leave or when new roles shift, you can start to think about uh, combining roles together or saying, can these two duties be held by one person? And so there are some ways in which we drove um, some efficiency on the cost side there, um, but it wasn't driving the efficiency of saying, hey, Drew, you are on staff now and now you're gone because we can't afford you. It was more kind of the natural attrition and finding some sort of ways to save costs as we think creatively about the spend there. Go down a little bit further, so that's on the staff side. Again, just na naming that some of the transitions, including of Kelly and others, have allowed us to think, allowed the staff to think creatively about spend on that front. Um, you'll also notice a separate line item around strategic planning. So now that David's been in his role, one of the things that's been a priority for the vestiary is to start to think about what is the future of St. Peter's? How does St. Peter's continue to evolve to meet a post-pandemic church world to meet a changing community here, to lean in in new ways uh, to uh, the work that we can and should do. And sometimes that benefits from an outside perspective, someone who can look at the work that we're doing and see it fresh, see it with fresh eyes. Um, and so built into this and also partly funded by a gift that was very generous in 2019 is the ability to fund a strategic planning effort um, that is still being nailed down but would uh, really involve listening from you all as, as congregants and determining some of the next steps for this church. Um, that's the main thing on the cost side on the, on the top end. I'm going to go on the bottom end of this and just name a few pieces. Um, so one element that is, is down um, is on the music side. We uh, went to David and uh, the other David um, and asked Dave to consider a number that was a little bit higher and a little bit lower and, and we ended up landing on the lower of those two numbers. We know this is a central part of this church. It's a central part of why um, I'm here and Kelly here, and I don't think Fitz cares too much yet, but he will care deeply about that. Um, and so uh, tried to do so with an eye towards uh, maintaining personnel, so didn't want to cut on the personnel side there. Uh, so uh, also had to ask David, what are things that just can't be moved? For example, organ maintenance and the like. Um, so David uh, and David had a couple good conversations about that, just trying to think about how to be creative on that spend there. Got some external feedback from folks who work in the, in the, uh, the business of churches, hearing how churches have been creative about how they purchase music, amongst other things. Um, I will say that when you look at this, it's actually a number in line with 2019. Um, so uh, one way to look at it is to say it looks like a pretty uh, significant cut, but if you think about it in the, in the broad span of years, it's kind of going back to what the music spend looked like uh, a couple years back prior to the pandemic. Um, but again, really uh, grateful for David and David having that conversation to think about what was uh, the optimal move and to do so in ways that really tried to maintain the experience of both the choir as well as the congregant experience as well. A um, couple other final points here. Um, you'll notice here, again, uh, Drew and I and the team started with about a two hundred seventy dollars to $300,000 gap between those two numbers. And so by virtue of thinking creatively on the top end revenue, as well as on the, the cost end, we were able to get it closer, um, but we didn't get it to zero, didn't get it to a fully balanced budget. Now, there's a couple things to note from this. One piece of this is that uh, we have had the generous gift that occurred back in 2019, which does give us some cash reserve to draw from. So for example, it's not that at the end of this year, 
we're going to have a bank account balance of negative $100,000. We have some money that we're able to draw from over time. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, the second thing is, as I mentioned, being conservative on the top end uh, means that I hope we blow it out of the water. I hope that our top end is, is quite a bit higher. I know that it's uh, not just because I'm the treasurer now, um, but because Kelly and I are thinking about our own philanthropic priorities, we're trying to find ways to support this congregation uh, in a different way. Um, so uh, what I'd say is the good news about this is that even with this number here, this is not something that's putting the church in a uh, perilous position. Uh, but I hope that being transparent about this gap is making people aware that even when we're trying to be, um, make, even when we're trying to make some difficult decisions when it comes to this, this is still kind of a hard, hard um, budget to balance. And so we want to think about how we can continue to invest in this congregation to do the work that we're doing now, as well as just to name some things, right? You might look at a few of these lines here and say, oh man, we're only spending $1,000 on young adults, $6,000 on adult ministry. Maybe there's other ways that we want to invest in a deeper way in, in other parts of the church. And that requires uh, increasing uh, giving from, from you all and other congregants. Um, so this was approved last week, this last week. The vestry saw the numbers. We went through several iterations back and forth. Uh, but this is where we landed and, and hopefully gives you a sense on some of the things that we're doing moving forward to make sure that St. Peter's continues to thrive for years and years to come. I'll name one final question that came up uh, just in anticipation that I should have addressed earlier. One question was um, how we support the diocese. Um, so that is a number that is basically in line with what we've done in the past, but it was less than the amount that was initially requested of us. Um, the reason that number was quite a bit higher, about fifty or sixty thousand dollars higher, is that it's a it's a an assessment on two years ago revenue. And if you think of two years ago revenue, some piece of that is the um, PPP money that was coming in. And so we were kind of being I don't want to call it a tax, but a good way to think of it is a uh, an assessment tax assessment on a number that was we think kind of higher than it would be otherwise. And so in our view, this is a way to continue to give to the broader diocese in ways to support the work that they're doing, um, something that we think that congregations should do. And at the same point, to kind of push back on some elements that we felt maybe weren't as fair as they could have been. So that was some of the cost savings uh, that we found amongst other things that we reviewed. Yes, please. I heard this this morning, but what is PPP? Yeah, so when you think of... Um, when you think of the impact on various different businesses, so the work that I do at Wash U, a lot of it is with small businesses and the like. Uh, there were a lot of businesses and nonprofits that essentially got hit with an inability to have revenue for a period of time. Um, schools had some of the same things. And yet, at the same point, costs are hard to adjust. So in summer of 2020, uh, spring to 20 of 2020, uh, a government bill was passed that allowed people to get a certain amount of capital based on the revenue that came in as essentially a, uh, not even a loan, it was a, a grant um, to be able to support operations. So basically, uh, government relief given to businesses, nonprofits, et cetera. And so if you look back to what would have been 2020 numbers. But we received the forgiveness in 21. 21, yes. Okay, so when you look at the revenue number that came in 2021, uh, a big reason why that was higher in that sense was tied towards the government grant money, which is not typical money that would come in from congregants. Is that a fair way to capture it, Drew? And, and also that the diocese received a PPP grant as well. They also gave it to municipalities. Correct, yeah. Yeah, municipalities, businesses, nonprofits. I mean, it really was, in a lot of ways, very helpful um, for many organizations to thrive. Um, but given that linked up with how the diocese works with churches, it, it led to something that we felt was a fair pushback from our end, while at the same point continuing to honor our, our commitment to, to the broader diocese. It's a great question. What's our status on the uh, tabernacle? Great question. Um, 
So Question was around the status on the tabernacle alone. I make you kind of dance to the front there. Do you want me to grab the microphone? Okay, so the question was the, the status of the loan. Um, so we, uh, folks might remember that when we planned on doing the renovation in the basement, replacing the windows, and also the Elliott room, um, there was a gift that, w uh, that some parishioners said that I'd like to make commitments towards that over the course of a few years. Um, and so we took out a loan from the, the diocese, it's, actually, it's called the White Fund, and so we had a, a loan to kind of allow us to do that work at that time while waiting on those gifts from parishioners to come uh, over the, the subsequent five years. Um, last year we did pay off the remaining balance of that loan. Is that what you were asking about? Oh, I see. I, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so then folks might also remember that um, I think it was just over a year ago we extended a bridge loan to the the Tabernacle in um, in North St. Louis in the Jeff Vanderloo neighborhood, so that they could open a community center um, while waiting to receive two different grants from the city of St. Louis. Um, and so Alan Ivey, I've, I've got to give him a ton of credit for really kind of spearheading not just that loan, but also keeping in touch with Pastor Andre over at the Tabernacle to kind of say, you know, where are you? Where do you think that those, when you might receive funding to be able to pay St. Peter's back? And he's committed to paying that back by uh, the end of February. So we're expecting to have that paid off within about a month and a half. And again, going back to, to this structure, right? That's something that we paid out of having that flexibility from before. Um, and that kind of beefs up to some degree some of the cash reserves in the in the budget. Please. Oh, the the uh, earth, earth loop, the earth pump uh, uh, replacement is about a hundred and three thousand dollars. I noticed maintenance was sixty three thousand dollars. Is that replacement cost being spread over two years, or is it in another bucket somewhere? For the HVAC. Yeah. Yeah, so the, it's a good question. So folks might be aware that we had to replace the, the thermal pumps for the, the, um, the HVAC here. And it was a very expensive project. Things like that go towards our capital rather than our operating fund. So you can imagine that if we were to you know, have that expense of hitting the operating fund, there would be a lot of choppiness and it makes planning a lot more difficult. So we have a separate capital fund that we're using for things like that. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that um, through some work that uh, David and others in the, the office spearheaded, we were able to receive a grant to offset uh, close to $80,000 of that. And so um, that's that's less of a draw on kind of our, our capital or the, the cash reserves. Was that a state or federal uh, energy conservation grant? Application. David, you might actually be able to speak to kind of that that grant that we received better than I can, but it's a family. It was it was a family foundation. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a good clarification because one of the things that we've been thinking about and working towards is almost saying you want to have one bucket that's really your operating bucket, and then a separate bucket to some degree that allows for some of these things that are unexpected, and also find ways to kind of uh, fund that in different ways over time. So I'm always available for questions and comments. Uh, my quick note on that, the only contingency is we're having a baby in about seven days, seven to nine days. So if I'm slow in response, uh, that might be why. But really appreciate uh, everyone that worked together to, to get this aligned over time. It takes a lot of people um, and a lot of hours to make it happen. Uh, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to learn about and serve the congregation in this way. So thank you all for your time.